We want to thank our sponsor, Dark Kryptonite. Dark Kryptonite stops ransomware, malware, and phishing in their tracks, eliminating cybercrime, fraud, and information warfare. Dark Kryptonite utilizes advanced blockchain algorithms and zero trust models. Learn more at www.darkkryptonite.com. My guest today is the field CISO for Hyperproof and a senior member of IEEE. Kay McLadry, CISSP, has over two decades of experience in cybersecurity and has served as a CISO, an advisory board member, and focuses on the policy, social, and economic effects of cybersecurity lapses to individuals, companies, and the nation. Hyperproof's mission is to help organizations demonstrate their commitment to upholding laws, standards, and ethical conduct to the communities through compliance operation software. Hey Kane, welcome to the show. I'm curious, what keeps you up at night? What's your cyber fear? Well, thanks for having me on the show today, Scott. And um, I have teenagers, so they definitely contribute to keeping me up at night, but not so much from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, I'd say right now, it's the risk of additional cyber market regulation due to kind of a continued perception of failure of market self-regulation. And related to that, the persistent risk that companies are treating cyber risk as different than a business risk. Now, maybe you could also tell us a little bit more about how people can reach out to you and connect with you. Um, sure. So on, I've got terrible OPSEC. Um, there is, my, my parents gave me the one name of Caden Gladry. There is exactly one person named Caden Gladry on the internet. So if you uh, <laughs> Google that or if you, um, apparently chat GPT knows about me too. So that's fun. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Caden Gladry. On LinkedIn, I'm at um, in slash Kane dot McGladry, I believe, or I don't think oh. it's a dot, but pretty easy to find. And to find Hyperproof, we're just at Hyperproof on both LinkedIn and um, on Twitter. So Kane, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the exciting stuff that you're doing as, as a field CISO, if that's okay. And a couple of things that kind of crossed my mind, maybe you could share with us a little bit more about market regulation and some of the great things that you share with different companies that you work with. Sure. So um, as a field CISO at Hyperproof, I'm responsible for a lot of, I guess you could say outreach to other CISOs in the field, but also other security leaders in the field. And um, I'm not sure if I can talk, I'm going to talk about this, but because it's just between you and I, I'm not going to mention mm -hmm. anything sensitive, but I run a private invite only uh, CISO roundtable. Um, oh. And I, this may be the only media mention of it ever in the history of ever, because a lot of CISOs don't have a community. They don't have people. And so as a consequence, as CISOs, we end up feeling very um, kind of embattled by the amount of sales outreach we get. Like a lot of the email, a lot of the communications, a lot of the conversations we have have a commercial bent. And it's very hard to focus on what actually works. And combine that with the nature of your average CISO of, you know, typically... A, a lot of imposter syndrome tends to roll into that role. And so there's this perception of that. I don't know if I'm doing it right. And nobody is actually telling me something trustworthy. So I'm working on actually providing that level of community um, to CISO so that we can chat amongst ourselves about what actually is effective cybersecurity in the face of what we're seeing as an increase in you know, the, the, the market regulators right now are trying to drive towards the behavior. And we're not seeing that behavior recognized in business. And this is ultimately how you get ants, right? Um, we do, we're, we're not solving the core problem. And the core problem often comes down to um, alignment between the CISO and the board or the CEO, uh, as opposed to what the current methodology is, which is the CISO reports to the CIO because... I'm still not sure, maybe because computers are involved. Like it, 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 it feels like a conversation from 20 years ago, not from today where functionally speaking, cyber risk is ultimately business risk. And so that's the other thing that I spend talking a lot about is around risk and how companies can be more effective at managing that, that business risk associated with a deleterious cyber effect 
Um, something that I'm doing at Hyperproof as well is um, kind of putting my thumb on the scale around product design decisions where I don't want to be overly prescriptive and in get into consulting here because Hyperproof does make a software solution. Mm-hmm. However, I do believe we should allow companies to more effectively automate tying down which controls mitigate which risks so that a CISO or a board can make or a CFO can make an effective decision over which controls actually are worth having anymore. Because there's a lot of stuff out there in cybersecurity right now that is not as effective as it could be, or you're paying too much for what it is. And in today's macroeconomic conditions, I don't think that's an acceptable state of play. Yeah, yeah I, I do hear that often. I think it's a good point. And you kind of talked about that that business risk a little bit. Maybe you can even help us show, share some of the balance between business risk and security controls for, from your perspective and what you're helping customers appreciate. So I think that business risk is ultimately cyber risk and companies that have separate risk registers for, you know, you've got your cyber risk one and you've got your business risk one. Um, if you combine that with the alignment of the CEO uh, has, you know, direct communications to the CIO, but the CISO doesn't, you end up in a situation where CISOs um, don't know why decisions are being made. They're being made apparently in a vacuum. So if you are a CISO and you believe that um, you're being unfairly treated because you don't know that the company is working on maybe a multinational expansion or maybe they're working against market collapse or any number of other business risks, that fragmented view of risk um, really drives poor security spending decisions. Uh, we did a, a report actually uh, just this year that found out one in two companies so half of the companies that managed um, security risk in silos from their business risk got breached in 2022. Sure. Now, that's not causality, but it sure feels interesting when you say that the companies that didn't um, have that fragmented view, but rather had a unified view of compliance and security risk instead uh, I think it was only one in three got breached. Now, still, that's not a great number, one in three, but also last year was not a great year. And anything we can do to more effectively communicate risk to the stakeholders, but also to technical participants, um, I think really helps improve the situation for everyone. Uh, I started this 20, oh, geez, 25 years ago, I think now. I think I might've been doing this for about that, that long. It feels like a minute. And a lot of what I've seen over the course of that time is we have well-meaning security professionals, uh, myself included, who said, hey, this you should have probably have a password on that, or maybe we should have a device inventory, or all of these recommendations that technical people have been making for decades that are common sense recommendations, if you think about them, um, are now getting put into market regulatory requirements. And that's because companies have had that disconnect between the business just doesn't think that cybersecurity is a thing because, again, computers are involved, which is a false narrative. I'd say that if a company has a tornado, well, companies doesn't have a tornado, but if a, if a, if a manufacturing facility is affected by a tornado or if a manufacturing facility is affected by a ransomware attack, the outcome is functionally very similar, if not identical, um, depending on the level of the tornado and the level of the ransomware attack. From a business perspective, you just lost your manufacturing capabilities, or you have to move your supply chain elsewhere as a, res- as a regard to that. And that level of conversation is only happening in some companies. Not all companies are treating cyber risk the same as that business risk. That's neat. Hey, I'm going to throw it a bonus question just because I'm curious. Tell us as a, as a field C, so what, what do you love about your job? And then maybe what do you hate about your job that you don't like that much? Um, great question. So I love talking to people. Um, okay. I, I have the, the privilege of having had a long career in cybersecurity. And so I love mentoring people to try and bring new people into the field, but also to pro- try to provide um, counselor guidance to CISOs and other senior security leaders who, like I've had the advantage of working across multiple industries and multiple countries and continents. So I, I like to think I have got a well-rounded perspective. Mm-hmm. I like to share that with people who um, 
need that alternate view on things. Um, I also love being able to work towards reducing the friction between the security team and the compliance team. Mm. Uh, and I say that because when I used to run executive advisory services or when I was an auditor or when I was a CISO at a defense industrial based company, I watched the same basic motion of the auditor asks for evidence. The internal team asks the security team for evidence. The security team go, you know, they've got 11 billion other things they're doing right now. They don't have time to get you a screenshot. So they start thinking that's, that compliance is a nuisance. Um, and so one of the reasons that I came to Hyperproof was, what if you could just automate that and say, hey, computer A needs a copy of the file off of computer B. This is like, this is the year 2023. We should be able to copy a file. Or I was, you know, I watched interns burn themselves out reading evidence for sufficiency and adequacy, which is what are you doing? You're looking at a report, which is an Excel file to see if there's a no in some column or an X in some column. Again, this is, this is stupid stuff that can be automated. And the reason that I came to Hyperproof is to help drive that vision forward so that security teams can then be more effective at doing security operations. Compliance teams can not chase them and then can spend their time on more creative interpretation and, you know, the, the things that take thought and intuition as opposed to just routine, boring stuff. Um, I get excited and passionate about that and that ability to provide that perspective to the product team. Um, the other half, what don't I like about my job? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I actually have to think about that one. While you're thinking about that, let me throw in one other one. And it's because I've talked to a lot of people recently about cybersecurity and jobs, and there's a lot of misreported things, so on and so forth. But what mm -hmm. kind of got you into cybersecurity, at least that that the start that really sure. got you? We'll go to that one after. I, I, I think I've got an answer for what I don't like about my job. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we can move to the... Um, Next question of how I got started, because that's a fun little story. Um, it's hard when you have a job that you love. What a problem to have, right? <laughs> um, hmm. Oh, I think I, I, I think I know. Okay, I got it. I got it. Got a good one. I'm not going to name names, but I got a good one. All right. And uh, we're, we're rolling, so we don't have to pause. No, no problem. But, in terms of what I don't love about my job, um, mm -hmm. there are a few professional organizations that we regularly work with to do presentations that have insanely early lead times for their materials. So I'm used to, uh, possibly as a consequence of having done executive advisory, you're finishing your PowerPoint the night before, right? Or maybe the week before, certainly not two months before. And I find that this, it seems to be a, a post-pandemic um, tendency where lead times for please give us your draft and your presentation two months before an event. Um, I, I don't really like that. And the team that I'm privileged to work with for materials development it causes us all to pull our hair out because if we want to refer to something that's current, how do you ever put it in the deck if it's going to be two months prior to some event occurring? Yeah, that's a good one. I can understand why you hate that, and they do too. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, how about what what came what what got you into cybersecurity? If we, if we go back, sounds like a couple decades ago. What kind of got you got you going? <laughs> so um, it's it's funny. I am a theater kid, so I was I was oh. taking theater all through high school, and I thought that I was going to have a fantastic career on Broadway, um, singing and dancing in musicals. I genuinely seriously believed this, and then I went to college and found out that the likelihood of that was around zero. Um, and because theater gives you good improvisational skills, which I do think are a necessary business skill, um, I was able to pivot that into conversations into, you know, let's do something with computers. And I uh, wasn't quite sure what to do at first around computers, but one of the first government contracts I worked on actually really showed me what I wanted to do. And to, to set it up, it was a, uh, a, a government agency that was responsible for people's pensions. Um, and their, um, they had a brand new data center, brand new facility that they put in. It was beautifully landscaped, brand new building, high security, high physical security. You know, they had, um, they had doors that locked, they had blast doors inside to get into the data center. And I was working in the data center regularly. And like it had this very, very buttoned up appearance and it 
all kind of fell apart when you could walk up to the terminal in the lobby and there was no username, there was no password. And if you wanted to see your pension information, you could just see it right there. And if you wanted to edit it, you could edit it right there. Wow. And that at the time seemed kind of crazy because this is people's retirements we're messing with. And it was that lack of perception that somebody would do something malicious. It sounds very naive in today's world of, um, you know, bank collapses, cryptocurrency thefts, financial theft. But back in the day, that was considered to be fine because physical security was um, was key. Unfortunately, this was in a, a connected. This was a connected environment, and so it wasn't very hard to find a way into the system. That first exposure really gave me the the, the, the sense that there was something to do with cybersecurity. And in the years since, what I've found is ultimately comes down to an organizational commitment and a culture of effective cybersecurity, because you don't get the idea of let's have a terminal in the lobby without a login where you can edit your pension without some managerial decision or indecision as a failure. I can think of banks that I've worked with that have got similar lack of controls, or I can think of manufacturing any segment. I can think of an instance, unfortunately, that because there has been a lack of perception that security is a necessity or that it's mitigating against an actual risk that's going to affect people. And that's where I get like, that's what bothered me about it at the time, I should say, is that if you take someone's retirement away, what are they going to do, right? And you could do that maliciously, accidentally, or intentionally, or if you want to give yourself a, a boost to your retirement, same problem. Um, I've been working against that ever since. And, uh, it's a sticky problem. It's hard and fun to work with. Yeah, I, I love that story. How it got you into cybersecurity? Hey, maybe one final question. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you you have a child or children. I have a, a son and daughter. It's kind of curious if if the, the children out there. Do you have anything you'd like to share to them when thinking about a career, maybe in cyber or maybe not? And any advice that you would share? So I would, and I've had the great privilege of um, talking at high schools, talking at colleges, talking at middle schools. Um, a good friend of mine's a teacher. She's trying to get me a speaking gig with an underprivileged um, school district to go talk to them about cybersecurity. And I'll, I'll say to your viewers, if you've never had the opportunity to present in front of a middle school, um, go do it as the best board, board communications training you'll get. Because if you lose that audience you're going to lose your board too because um, they, they do not care and they have very little patience, uh, which is fantastic training. And what I'd say to kids these days is that cyber careers, um, they pay well. They pay well like a middle-class salary with a two-year degree, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is ultimately the message that we can come to because – it's not all hands on keyboard. I know people who work in marketing. I know people who work in sales, people who work in product design. Some people are coders, you know, the proverbial pounding their hands into the keyboard all day long, but not everybody does that. And when you look at other careers right now that you can go into where you spend two years in college, maybe get a certification on the side and you're suddenly making $90,000 a year out of the gate that you can put right back into your own community's wealth, there aren't a lot of other jobs that have got that quick return on investment. And I think that as you know, kids start going to college, mine included, that's a conversation to have. You know, obviously not everyone, like it's, it's not the new doctor, it's not the new attorney, it's not the new, right? But it is in that class with a very fast ability to earn revenue and not very big student loans, which is kind of cool. Plus you're helping people. Right. At the end of the day, that's the other thing you're doing is you're helping your friends, you're helping your community, you're helping your coworkers. I, I like that point because that is true. Because there's 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 a sense of accomplishment there that you're you're doing something positive. I always feel good, and I tell people I'm fighting the bad guys, the cyber criminals, and even though I can help this much. I feel good inside and, and, and that's important. Well, I, hey, I really appreciate Kane, you, you spending some time sharing some of your insight and, and doing the great things that you do in the community, helping everyone from young, keeping all of us safer. So th thanks again for, for everything and, and joining our segment. Thanks so much, Scott.